right. Well, thanks again, Ben. Appreciate your help leading us today. Quick reminder, as always, if you have a prayer request, something that you would like us to pray for, um, it doesn't always get announced publicly, just so that you know that's only at the request of, of those involved. Um, but if you have a prayer request, you can drop us an email to prayers at westwoodchurch.net. You can fill out one of those prayer sheets on your way out of the worship center and put them in one of the silver bowls if you'd like. And there should always be an elder waiting to pray for you in our prayer room off to the left if you'd like that after any of our services. So I mentioned we're talking today about living in freedom from regret. And, and I think regret is something that most people deal with um, on lots of levels, ranging from the petty to the profound. Now, on the petty side, I think many people have experienced what's called buyer's remorse. Buyer's remorse is the letdown sometimes people feel after a purchase disappoints in face of their expectations. It doesn't quite live up to the promise of what it claimed it would do or whatever. And I think a cousin of buyer's remorse is what I recently heard about when I heard about a whole bunch of people who had traveled to various national parks and then left one-star reviews because they were disappointed by the experience, which I suppose is one way of dealing with that kind of buyer's remorse, even if it's something of a passive-aggressive one. When people deal with the regret of having spent precious time and money going to a national park and it didn't live up to their expectations. Now, I heard about this, actually, uh, because a designer, her name is Amber Scher, she read a bunch of these one-star reviews on various websites, and she decided to, quote, put a positive, fun spin on such a negative mindset. And she did that by creating a bunch of travel posters that were meant to kind of mimic some of the ones that get circulated highlighting the benefits of these national parks, but instead highlighted these one-star reviews. So uh, I'd like to share a few of those with you. First, here's one from Yosemite. National Park. Trees block view and there are too many gray rocks. <laughs> Trees and rocks at a national park. I, okay. A hole, a very, very large hole. Grand Canyon National Park. So Grand Canyon, large hole. I, they're not that different. I don't know what exactly they were expecting, but it was one star worthy. Here's one more for you. Scenery is distant and impersonal, Zion National Park. Now, of all these, this gets me the most, because I think, now, what did they want to have happen? Did they think that they'd show up, get out of their car, and, like, the distant rock would run up and introduce itself by name, so it would be less distant and impersonal? I, I'm still dumbfounded by that one. But anyway, that's one way of dealing with regret, leaving petty one-star reviews about national parks basically being national parks. But, of course... There are more serious regrets that we sometimes deal with. What, what do we do with those? Maybe these are things that are known to others and they're open secrets, so to speak. Maybe they're things that are unknown to anyone except the one holding on to it. Perhaps they're words spoken, actions carried out, or not spoken, not carried out. Perhaps they're deep thoughts, attitudes and inclinations of the heart, the kind of things that haunt us in times of quiet when our usual distractions are, are gone and we're left wrestling with them, wishing more than anything that we could just make them go away or undo them. It's not that easy. I think wrestling with those deeper things is actually the impulse of something I came across a long time ago called Post Secret. I'm not sure if you've heard about this, but it began back in 2005 um, and it's ongoing today. It's, it's a community art project where people anonymously share their secrets and regrets. Now, it started in 2005 where people would take postcards uh, with a bit of, a, of an image and some words expressing their confession, their regret, their secret, and they would send it to an address without any sender information connected, and then it would be posted. And it's since become an ongoing project online. It's this online depository of some of the same where people anonymous, anonymously share these secrets, confessions, and they range from the comical to the dark to the very disturbing. Um, and it's amazing uh, how much interest this has gathered over the years. And I'm sure that even an anonymous confession like that through what Post Secret does is helpful in some ways. But I also think that the anonymity of it, that is that there is a lack of another person and that's part of what's driven this betrays the reality that there probably needs to be something more. More than just an anonymous confession. And that's actually, I believe, part of the invitation to live in freedom from regret. And that's part of what the scripture speaks about. In Old Testament and New. 
So we're going to read this morning two passages, one from Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 through 5, found on page 427 in the Bibles under your chairs. If you'd like to look it up there, you can. And then the second passage is in the New Testament, James chapter 5. We're just going to read verse 16, and that's on page 932. Again, you can look that up if you want. We'll have words on the screen. You can follow along there. But these two passages taken together give us deep insight into what to do with that impulse when we're dealing with the feeling of regret that, again, I believe is common to us all. So would you stand, please, as I read these two passages? Starting in Psalm chapter 32, it says this. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Now we turn to James chapter 5 and just read verse 16 where it says this. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. My friends, this is God's word to us today. Thanks be to God. God, we do thank you for your word. And as always, as always, we ask that his power would be worked in us in whatever way you want, according to your gentle and good forming of your kind of life in us. May that be so today. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, I think in these two passages, the pathway to live more in freedom from regret is laid out pretty plainly. And it's through the confession of our sins. Now, there are two main types of confession of our sins. There's confession before God and confession before others. First of all, the heart of that Psalm 32 passage we wrote speaks to our confession before God. And this absolutely is the first and most important kind of confession. Make no mistake about that. See, we are ultimately accountable with what we've done with our lives before God, who is the giver of life, the definer of right and wrong. And God is the ultimate one then against whom we sin when we choose to reject his, God, his rightful rule in our lives or in the world. And so we rightly start by confessing and acknowledging those wrongdoings before the Lord. Matter of fact, in another psalm, in Psalm 51, David, the writer of that psalm, is wrestling with his own sin. You may be familiar with this story. He decided to commit adultery with Bathsheba, leveraging his power over her, and then chose, in order to hide it, essentially have Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, murdered. And when he was confronted in that sin by the prophet Nathan, he was racked with guilt and had to decide what he would do with that. And of course, in the end, he decided to confess his sin. And in his expression of that, in Psalm 51, he says, against you and you only, O Lord, have I sinned. Now, Obviously, that doesn't mean he didn't sin against those other people. Clearly, he did. But the point is, he's saying, you, Lord, most of all, above all, are the one against whom these actions have been a, a transgression, have been a wrong. So we do need to confess to God. And thankfully, we have the assurance that we've already centered ourselves on this morning. As it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from unrighteousness. The same impulse, the same part of the gospel and God's forgiveness offered to us freely is repeated everywhere, all over in the New Testament as it has come to us through Jesus and through his death on our behalf. And so what that means is when we start here, when we confess our sins before God, we never have to wonder how God receives that confession. We can have full assurance that God welcomes us, forgives us, wipes the slate clean out of his pure love and grace for us that never ended even when we chose to do what we did. The other confession, the other main type, of course, is confession to others. And that was the emphasis of the James chapter 5, verse 16 reading. This practice of confession to others can actually lead to an even deeper experience of God's grace and forgiveness and can lead to a deeper transformation of our lives. 
Now we do this, we confess before others, not because God needs it. It's not as though God is clinging tightly to his mercy and we have to pry it from his grip. Again, the gospel makes it clear that's not the case at all. Instead, confession to others is actually for us and for those that we have wronged. In order to bring deeper healing and change in human relationships. You see, to have flesh and blood be with us in a vulnerable moment, hear us, and then pronounce the grace of God upon us is a profound and deep experience that can change us and ready us to live according to our values and convictions in the future. Now, as I suggest to you, as I'm going to today, that confession of sin in, in person to other people is a practice that can help lead us to a life free of regret, I would expect that some people may have hesitations or objections to this, so I want to just kind of address a couple of those briefly. The first may be, well, do I have to do this? And my plain answer would be no. No, you don't have to do this. But you can. And if you do, I truly believe you'll find it to be a gift and a treasure. Even though it is true that some have twisted this practice of confessing our sins to other people into a way of creating it as like a, like a manipulative prerequisite to God's forgiveness. Let's make clear, that is not what's going on here. God's forgiveness is offered freely. Confession to other people is not some way of dangling out uh, as if a carrot in front of someone what is offered as a free gift by God himself. So do you have to do this? No, no you don't, but you can't. I think you'll find it's a good thing. It's a healing practice. Another hesitation might be this. Well, I mean, what if I'm afraid? That seems pretty scary. That seems like a lot of effort to put forward when it's not really needed between God and me. And I'd say, yeah, that's true. It can be actually kind of a scary experience. And, and it is a disruption of our usual pattern of things. But I would also say that that's actually part of its formative power. First of all, being met in our vulnerability with such grace as what this kind of practice is meant to embody can help form and shape us. And second, it does give us good reason to make good on our commitments, to, to live according to our values, according to what's right in the future when we may otherwise be tempted to think that the repercussions, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I'll just kind of go with it. Another question might be, well, how do I even start? Like, why would I, how would I go about that? And that's what I'd like to share with you next. So I would say there are actually two subtypes of confession to other people. Two main types, God and others. Two subtypes of confession to other people. There's direct and indirect. Direct confession is when we go directly to the person that we have wronged. Admitting, confessing, and acknowledging what we have done to be wrong. But sometimes that's actually not the best course of action. And there might be lots of reasons for that, and I won't take time to go into it now. But in those cases, confession to another person can still be a powerful part of experiencing the God's grace and being transformed. And in those cases, I would suggest that indirect confession is a way to go about that. This is having a person to whom you can go, not the one you've directly wronged, to confess out loud, to be completely honest with, so that they can then embody the grace of God and the truth of God for you. Now in practical terms, this often takes the form of what's called an accountability partner or perhaps a spiritual director or something like that. In both of those subtypes, that is direct and indirect, I would say that the process is basically goes like this. There's two parts of that. It's to prepare and then confess. So the prepare part of that starts with us and doing some self-examination, similar to what we did together a moment ago, but maybe uh, on the more individual level, and asking the Holy Spirit again to shine its light into our hearts, revealing to us what we may need to confess. Now, this is not meant to be an exercise where we are writing, writing or creating an exhaustive list of our sins. As a matter of fact, going that route, I can't help be reminded of what John, the writer of John's Gospel said in John 21. It's a little bit different, but it's a parallel. He's nearing the end of his gospel, and he says, listen, these things Jesus did and said, and much more. Matter of fact, so many more, that if I were to write them all down, the whole world wouldn't be big enough to contain all the books that would need to be written. At least for me, if I was going to make an exhaustive list of everything I have thought or done or said that was a sin, it'd be kind of like that. I'm not sure where I'd stop if I have, that was my aim. And I'm being a little bit exaggerating, you know, there, but like, not really. That would be a long process and really would kind of miss the point. 
The point is that we allow the Spirit to examine our hearts and then look for what surfaces as the most important issues that we need to confess to someone else. So to prepare, it means to begin by self-examination, allowing the Spirit to be a part of that process. And then allowing our perception of our actions to be changed so that we no longer see them from our standpoint, what we perhaps would have gained in a temporary and hollow way from that action or word or thought, but instead see them from the perspective of another and the way that those things have brought damage and harm. And then ultimately seeing them from God's perspective and seeing rightly for what they are. When we put ourselves up as if we were number one, as if we were the caller of all the shots, as if we were the one who was most important in the world. And, and what a really pretty twisted way of seeing things that is. Which then leads to the third part of preparing, which is to open ourselves to a new feeling about those actions, which is called contrition or godly sorrow. Now, this isn't shame-inducing like beating ourselves up. Instead, it's an appropriate sadness when we recognize the wrong that we've done. And that's actually a good thing because, again, that can lead to a transformed life, especially when paired with the next part, which is to confess. And this is a lot more simple, but whether it's direct or indirect confession, we specifically name inward and outward sins and then renew our commitment to walk in loving faithfulness to God and to others. And God willing, the point of all of that, to prepare and then confess, is to receive God's grace in a new, profound, and embodied kind of way. So that's something of the process, to prepare and then confess. Now when it comes to direct confession, it's obvious who it is that we would go to, but what about indirect confession? Where would we go for that? And how? Well, that's what I want to share with you about next. See, I think once again, there are two parts. If we decide, we think indirect confession is something that really we believe would help transform us, help us live in freedom from regret, experience God's grace, where would, where would we go next? Now, I think first step is to, to make a plan, which means a few things. It means first identifying a trusted friend. I would bet that there is someone in your life, if you desire to go this route, whom you could go to and you could have this kind of a friendship with. I would encourage you first and foremost to pray and ask God to direct you to who that might be. And I would encourage you to look for a person who also is a follower of Jesus, who understands the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God through Christ, who is wise, who is grace-filled, and who is a truth-teller. And when I say truth-teller, I don't mean like a shame-inducer, not someone who's going to hear your confession and say, boy, you are pretty messed up. Like, I knew it was bad, but that's really bad. No, we're, we're talking about somebody who, perhaps with curiosity and, conf and compassion, can draw out what is true, even in the face of our tendency towards self-deception. So a person like that. In fact, Henry Nouwen said this, I think is applicable to our situation. Henry Nouwen said, only in the context of grace can we face our sin. Only in the place of healing do we dare to show our wounds. And only with a single-minded attention to Christ can we give up our clinging fears and face our own true nature. So that's why I think if you're going to make a plan, it starts with identifying a trusted friend who is a follower of Christ, who is wise, who is grace-filled, and who is a truth-teller. And after that, the simple next step is to make the request. Ask that person if they're willing to go on this kind of journey with you, to enter into maybe a different phase of friendship. And here's what I would guess, at least if what's true for me has, will be true for you. If you do that, what you will probably find is that that person would like that too. That that person actually needs that too. And that the friendship will be deepened by having taken this kind of a risk and making this kind of a plan and a request. And then the last part is simply deciding when and where and how you're going to meet. What parts of your life you're going to focus on and confess to one another where needed and hold one another accountable and with grace. Which brings me to the second part of how to go about indirect confession. First is make a plan and do those things. But the second part is just as important. And that is to be ready to receive confession as well. See, it's not all about us. We need to confess, but so do others perhaps need to confess to us. So we should be ready to do that. First and foremost, by always and ever living under the shadow 
of the cross. Recognizing our great need for forgiveness and the tendency towards, of, of all humanity, including ourselves and others, towards twisting God's goodness to meet our own selfish needs in an incorrect way, in an illegitimate way. Recognizing that is the first step in preparing to receive confession. And then when that time comes, to be a compassionate listener, to not seek to correct, soothe over, fix, but to listen compassionately. And then when words are what's needed, make them brief and to the point, offering God's grace, thanking them for trusting you enough to share that with them, telling them, I don't think any less of you for sharing this. Thank you. I know what it's like to, to have regrets. And then finally, to boldly and directly pronounce God's grace lavishly over them, knowing that the promise of the gospel is true. So we can do that. And that's part of how this shapes us. So as I close here, as an illustration of, of why this practice can be so powerful in our lives, I was reminded of a scene from uh, a movie called The Way Back. I don't know if you've seen it. Not the Ben Affleck one about basketball. Uh, this is one uh, inspired by a, a memoir written in 1956 called The Long Walk, which uh, tells the tale of a former World War II Polish prisoner of war under the Soviets. And in, uh, in the movie, it gets turned into a historical fictional character whose name is Janusz Wieszczek. Now, in the opening scene of the movie, as you see here, the wife of Janusz has been coerced and perhaps even tortured into a statement that condemned him, her husband. And so as a result of this, he goes to a Soviet labor camp and labors there for years in harsh conditions. And eventually, he and a few others actually end up escaping. And they decide that they're going to somehow find a way to make the long walk back home or the, the way back. They're going to they're gonna find a way. And so it ends up being very complicated. They have to go way around various places and territories and through all kinds of terrain and such. And along the way, not everyone makes it. It's hard. Some people perish along the way. And so there's this one scene near the end of the movie where those who are left are wondering, frankly, whether they can go on, whether it's worth it to go on. Why would they go on? And a conversation unfolds between Janus and another person there. And, and an answer to why, why he is going to keep going no matter what, no matter what, Janus speaks of his own wife and he says this. You see, she'll never be able to forgive herself for what she's done. I don't know what they did to her, but I know she'll never be able to forgive herself. Only I can do that. And that's why I have to get back. That's a powerful illustration of the way that confession to others in such a way so that we receive the grace of God through others can do such good in our lives. See, regret is a powerful force in our life, but God's grace is more powerful still. So may we experience that grace more fully. May we be formed in freedom as we consider taking on this practice of confessing our sins to one another, praying for one another, that we may be healed and transformed. May that be so. Let's pray together. Gracious God, I thank you again for your good word to us, calling us out of darkness and into the light, calling us to confess our sins before you, and then even daring to wisely but boldly, with much fear and trembling perhaps, go before another and confess our sins there as well, that we might more fully experience your grace and forgiveness, that we may actually live in freedom from the crippling power of regret. May we be formed into such people who are both willing to offer that kind of a confession and also ready to receive it, knowing that each of us stands beneath the shadow of your cross where you have borne the weight of all of our sin and pronounced forgiveness and love over each one of us. No strings attached. Thank you for that gift. 